Welcome to the channel. I'm going to walk you through the materials that we're going to be using in this painting demonstration today. You'll notice that I use the line of Cobra. This is the water mixable oils. And let's get started with it. Colors in my limited palette. Titanium white. Primary yellow. Pyro red. Matter Lake, Ultramarine Blue, and then Phalo Blue. You don't need as much of the Phalo Blue. It is a very strong and powerful color, so I would recommend buying a smaller tube. Normally, it's economical. It's cheaper to buy the large tubes, the 150 milliliter tubes, like these in comparison to the 40 milliliter tubes. Unless you're going plain air painting and you really want to make sure that you're as light as possible, then you may want to buy the smaller tubes. But if you're wanting to save money, always go with the big tubes. Let's look at the day's brushes. I use the Princeton Aspen line. This is a synthetic brush and they work very well with the water mixable oils. I use uh, primarily flat. So this is a number six flat here. And then I also use a number four flat. These are the workhorses. Take those out. I also use a number two round. And this is a number two liner brush. Some people call this a rigger. I also use a palette knife, just a diamond shaped palette knife. This is by Blick. And the number on it is 46. Then I have a package of these, they're called erasers. They have rubber tips on them. I like to sign my work using uh, one of these that's kind of shaped like a pencil with a little point on the end. It's also great for removing some, some paint. I just put my water in one of these airtight containers with the hook. And I just take it and put it on the tripod like that. And then I also use a little palette cup the only medium I tend to use is the quick dry medium by Cobra. For the easel, I'm using the Strata Mark II, which accepts panels as well as canvas. And then I'm using the Strata uh, tray. This is the cheaper tray. They have one that actually closes up. I prefer this, uh, I think at this point in time, as I'm making this video, it costs about uh, $67 for this, as opposed to, I think it's like $200 for the, um, the actual one that goes with the Mark II. All right, let's get started. Welcome to the channel. So we're painting on an 11 by 14 canvas panel today. We're going to be using those water mixable oils I just showed you using a limited palette. There we go again. Of course, it's the uh, yellow primary. It's pyro red. It's uh, matter lake red and then ultramarine blue. Uh, I did put phalo blue on there, but I'm not going to use it today. And also titanium white and the medium I'm using is the quick dry medium made by Cobra as well. Of course, with this, we can just use water instead of mineral spirits to, to make a very thin layer of paint. What I'm doing now is going to, I'm going to paint the underpainting. Since this is going to be a primarily green painting, I'm going to do a very light wash of red. And parts of this will show through. It's 
So here I'm just watering that down with water and the water mixable oil. Of course, what happens is the water will, will dry very quickly. It'll evaporate in the air and then the pigment is left on your canvas. So what I do is just uh, just mix it up a little bit. I'm using um, a flat brush. This is actually a hog bristle brush to do this wash in. And once I get enough paint on there, I'm going to take a paper towel and then kind of remind you of a, a project in which you might be staining something. And so I'm just going to put a little bit of water on my paper towel and you'll see me in just a moment wipe over the entire panel with that. One thing is I'm, I'm getting used to using the Strata Mark II easel, which I really like the design and it, it's certainly going to hold up well in the future. But the only thing I don't like is the clips that actually hold the panel in. It's kind of difficult to paint underneath them. And so that's one thing that I, I do not like very well. There's probably a way to mount the canvas on here a little bit differently without having to use those little brackets. But I haven't had enough time to, to really invest in figuring that uh, a solution out to that. So see, I'm just taking a little uh, paper towel, just making sure that, that I'm covering the canvas, get rid of the white. And you'll see me loosen up from the very back the Strata easel. This is the mast portion. There, there we go. I'm, I'm just getting that out away from the canvas enough that I can go back behind it and put the underpainting on. You do see me wearing gloves today. I just picked up a, a cheap pair of gloves from... Lowe's, which work just fine. I tend to be a messy painter. I don't know about you, so especially in a small studio, I don't really want to get paint everywhere. From time to time, you'll see me uh, leave the screen. I'm using today a reference photo and I have it on my, my laptop. So every once in a while I have to adjust it or keep the screen from going off, that kind of thing. The scene is actually on a farm that is located between Augusta, Missouri and Dutso, if you're familiar with that area. I think the actual road was called Empke. Locals use this road as a kind of shortcut through Augusta Bottoms to get past uh, a few stop signs, and but it's uh, partially a, a gravel road. So, but it's also sections of it are have a blacktop. So this is close to Highway 94, the particular scene. Here I'm just uh, cleaning off the palette from the underpainting. And I showed you these in the intro. These are the Princeton Aspen synthetic flats. I also use a, a number two round and then also a liner, a number two liner. Here I'm mixing up my dark mixture as we start with our darks. So this is a mixture of all three of the primaries, just a little bit of red and then some of the yellow primary and of course ultramarine blue. And I'm putting this layer on very thin. And you can tell that I, I'm trying to make sure that this particular blue
doesn't have a whole lot of red in it and doesn't have a whole lot of yellow in it. So that way it will hopefully sit back in the landscape in terms of uh, the tonal value. And we're not going to put a lot of detail in this. I'm looking at the big shapes. So the big shapes today is the sky region, which is basically the top one third of the painting. You, you also don't want to, to break it up into sky and land in almost equal measures that will make for a boring painting. So the sky, as you can tell there, is the upper third. The point of interest is going to be a tree which is going to be just off center to the left. We'll have a field and then up close in the foreground will be some bushes and such. Here's a dark uh, purple. We're going to use this dark purple as sort of the underpainting for the tree. And on top of that, I will be putting my other green mixtures but for now I'm I'm painting basically this shadow portion of the tree and uh, I'm doing it very thin so that way like I said I will be able to come back with some thicker paint and paint over the top of this and by taking care of it almost the first thing that will give us some time to let this this shape dry and set up so that'll be easier for me to come in over top of it with thicker paint. So if you have trouble painting on top of, of paint, that could be the issue. You have to paint very thin and allow a little bit of time to dry before you can go back in on top of that with another color. Otherwise, what, what you'll make is mud because the additional color that you're coming in on top of it, if it mixes with the paint underneath it, that's how you get mud. Now, there are times in which you may want mud. You, you may want that particular color. But if you're really trying to get the effect of shadows and, and highlights and such, you want to make sure that the shadows go in first. That's why many other artists will tell you, start with your darks. That way it's easier to remember to keep those very, very thin. And then when you get to the lighter colors, make sure that you are using enough paint. That's the other problem is that uh, oftentimes People don't start thin enough, and then they don't finish thick enough. So thin to thick. And if you're having trouble with mud, then you probably are not using enough paint when you're coming over top of something that you've already put onto your canvas. And once in a while, you want to take a little bit of time, like I did there, to to clean up the palette so that way you won't contaminate your colors. I don't do that all the time and I am getting used to, I, I did for a while use the water mixable oils. I will say it takes a little bit of time to get used to how much you need to mix in order to make a particular color. I find that water mixable oils, I have no problem painting with them, but you do end up using more paint, I think from the water mixable oil tubes than you do regular oil. I don't know why that is, but for me at least it seems like it takes a little bit more paint to get the mixture and then to actually get it onto the, the panel. Now it could be that my panels are just absorbing it more and I, because these underlayers have a little bit more water in them, maybe that is, is affecting it some way. But like here, I kind of struggled to, to get this color off of the palette and onto the panel. 
it seemed like I, I really needed, it, it just seemed like the, the canvas panel was really soaking up the color more so than what I experienced with regular oils. Other than that, as far as the colors and so forth, I, I think that you can do just fine. You can do anything that you can do with oils with these water mixable oils. And the, the biggest benefit is that I'm in a very small space right now and I don't want to have any fumes whatsoever. There's not very, uh, it, the, the ventilation is not very good in this, in this room. So, but I have found that, uh, obviously there's, there's not much going on here. All I've got is the tubes of paint. So all that, all that paint is, is the pigment plus linseed oil. So you're not getting any fumes there. And then in my little canister, which used to have mineral spirits, I just put water. And so there's no fumes, no lightheadedness, no headaches, no dizziness. And I must tell you that even with the Gamsol, in this, in this uh, tiny space, I was using some Gams Gamsol uh, mineral spirits and traditional oils. And it... I could tell it was affecting me. And so that's why I've made the change back to the Cobra water mixable oils. Now I have not tried. Windsor Newton also makes a variety of uh, water mixable oils these days. But I like Cobra for one simple fact that the color seem to be, the oil seems to be a little bit more creamy. And they make the larger tubes and the colors that I traditionally use. And so it's just cheaper to, to use that rather than the uh, Windsor Newton. So, but if you're just getting into water mixable oils, those are two fine companies to try. You may want to pick up a tube of each to, to kind of get started. And, and see what you what you think of of the different uh, texture of the, the paints out of the tube from those two companies. Now here, um, starting from the top and moving towards the foreground, so I've already established the, the main dark, which is the tree, and now I'm coming in, giving time for that tree to dry for one thing, and I decided to just use the ultramarine blue for my mixtures for the sky. And so, obviously, in the sky, you start a little bit dark on the top, and it gets lighter towards the horizon. And so you can see that it's a small distinction on the video, but... We need to keep in mind that most most of the distinctions in the painting do need to be somewhat non-dramatic. <laughs> in other words, you, you want the subtlety of changes. The sky is not going to look right if it looks like there's, there's a flag involved. In other words, uh, if you see a harsh line in the sky, that's that's a little jolting. Now, you see that the underpainting is a little bit of a, an orangish red. And I actually allow some of that underpainting to show through the sky. I just think it warms the painting up a little bit. And when I get to the point where I'm going to put some, some clouds in, it will help. Now, here I take the blending brush. This is a fan brush. Number two, this is actually a hog bristle brush. I would recommend when you're using water mixable oils that you should use synthetic uh, brushes. Uh, my personal choice would be to invest in, Princeton has a wonderful line of Aspen brushes that are synthetic fiber brushes that are very similar to Rosemary Co. Um, ivory line, but a little bit cheaper. And if you don't want to ship it from England to, to your home and that kind of thing, uh, by all means, you could uh, ivory line from uh, 
Rosemary Co. is probably the best. But I found nothing wrong with using the Princeton Aspen line. It's, it's very comparable. So I blended in with that fan brush the blue. So that way there's just, you can kind of see it on the video that the top portion of the sky is a little bit darker than near the horizon line. And then it's a little darker blue over by the tree. Now I've cleaned my brushes off and I'm, I'm getting some of that uh, quick dry medium because this is going to be a final coat with these clouds. I'm taking the titanium white. You see me mixing it on the palette. And then I'm warming it up by just uh, dipping it into just a little touch of the yellow primary. And now I'm uh, mixing that on the palette. This will also make the, make the clouds a little bit warmer. This is a late May. Now, this type of subtlety may be a little hard to see on the video, but I think you can make out what I'm doing. These are some distant clouds that are there, so it's going to amount to just a few color shifts, so that way it's not just a, a plain blue sky. I always find plain blue skies, even if that's what you're seeing, I think they're very boring in a painting. And so if you are out sometime and all you have is, is just a clear blue sky, not, not a cloud up there, I would still put some clouds in. Some way to, to shift some of the color, especially if the sky takes up some room on the, on the canvas of your painting. Another technique would be to simply make sure that the sky composes no more than one-third of the surface of your painting if it's boring, right? Uh, there's no sense in having two-thirds of it be sky if there's nothing there to paint. That's, uh, that would be deadly for a, a painting. So sometimes artists will, will to almost totally take out the sky when it is a very... Um, uh, boring sky when it's just one one solid color or use their artistic license like I'm doing and and imagine some clouds now of course uh, on this particular day it's it would just be wrong to paint uh, rain clouds so uh, these are more billowy billowy clouds Here, I'm noticing that the horizon line is a little darker than I wanted it. And so I am going and making a little bit lighter mixture and going along the horizon line with some of that titanium white mixed with a little bit of yellow to, to further emphasize some color shifts there. And I'm also using it in a, in the negative way in terms of cutting into some of the landscape greens in that background. I can shape those a little bit as I put in that lighter blue sky at the horizon line. So, wonderful thing about oils is they're very forgiving. So you can come back over. Just have to make sure that you have enough paint on the brush that you're not creating mud you want it to kind of lay on top of the color that you've already laid down and of course part of the key to painting is leaving it alone after that when you've when you put down a color keep telling yourself leave it you can always come back and paint over top of it if you need to yes you will hear from time to time some noise in the background it is uh, the high 80s today, and so I'm uh, in an upstairs uh, bedroom painting and, and uh, what I've uh, made a makeshift uh, studio out of. And so in order to really paint up here, I need, I need the uh, temp.
temperature to be a little cooler. So you'll pardon the um, wall air conditioning as it comes on and off periodically. I hope that doesn't bother you too much. Now here, we've got these fields. that are brown and so what I'm trying to do now is to go over top of that underpainting with these essentially brown fields where they've either just harvested something or planted something I'm, I'm not quite sure but but there's there's definitely a contrast between some of the the grasses so And this mixture is just, of course, with a very limited palette, you don't have a whole lot of choices. And so the way you get a, a nice neutral is by mixing your three primaries. And so this is a, essentially a mixture of a little bit of the Matter Lake Red, Ultramarine Blue, and the Yellow Primary. Didn't use a whole lot of the Pyrrol Red this time around, and certainly not in this mixture. And then... Uh, and then you add titanium white once you get that brown to get it to the um, the tonal value that you want. Of course, you want it to be a little lighter. Uh, remember that um, your lightest plane is usually going to be your sky. The second lightest is going to be the, the land because it's reflecting the light that's coming from the sky upwards. And then the, the darkest planes are going to be your verticals, which would be if you had a building, it's going to be a building, perhaps. If it's a tree, it's going to be a tree. And here is a good example of it in this painting. The background trees are certainly darker than anything else around it. And then the tree in the middle, which is our focal point today, is certainly the darkest part of it. And of course, um, if you've got verticals, I have some verticals that are going to be put in to the foreground. And those will also be darker than the land plane and the sky plane. The one exception would be when you're painting water. Uh, sometimes the water is light like the uh, ground plane. Sometimes it's darker than that. So uh, water is not something that you can necessarily always assume is going to be uh, a certain value in relationship to what else is going on. So here, one of the things I'm doing with the brush is I'm looking for spots and, and trying to use my brush strokes to indicate some texture, some lines that I am seeing in the, in the photograph. And I'm also going to be leaving uh, space up front for the, the foreground uh, shrubbery that's going to be placed in there. And at this point, I have uh, purposely left the, the dark shadowed tree alone. That's not going to be remaining that color. But I want it to dry as much as possible before I tackle it. And it gives me an opportunity to do some of the foreground and then I can make sure that, given what values I put in the foreground, that that tree is going to stand out enough with whatever green mixture I have. If I painted the tree with those highlights first, it, it may be difficult for me to get a contrast with such a limited palette with the foreground um, verticals. Now I think you can see how this painting is coming coming together we've established perspective the tree that is the focal point is standing out even now it's it's coming forward towards the viewer okay right now my shirt is coming forward towards the viewer there we go and uh, you can see the the background trees against the the sky we've got some some variety going on in this plain field and that's what we wanted. We wanted to have some variety there so that it doesn't look all one color. 
if you're having some, some difficulties as a beginner, you can slightly vary your mixtures just a little bit to where if you squint, you, you see almost the same color. But when, when you are uh, both eyes open and you're not squinting, you see a little bit of difference in the color mixtures, right? So in that ground plane right now, you can see some purples, you see some pinks, and you see some tan tones, and, and that's, that's what I want. I want there to be a little bit of variety in those, uh, in those fields that provide some more interest. Now I'm mixing up uh, some greens for the foreground, and I'm going for kind of a, a mid-shade, if you will, right now. And that way, over top of it, I'm going to come in with some darks and maybe some lights. Now, one of the issues sometimes when you're painting foreground is to watch out for repetitive strokes. So I'm trying to vary the strokes. And I'm also thinking, well, this is a vertical plane, so... Most of my strokes are vertical strokes, up and down, to suggest the foliage that's growing. And of course, one of the goals is going to be completed soon is, is that we want to get paint everywhere on the canvas. And once we've done that, then it becomes easier to come back in and do your highlights. Now, right now, that's, that's rather boring, right? It's just one color of green, vertical strokes. It, it doesn't really suggest a whole lot. But that's okay because we are... Now I can mix back in that same pool of color like I'm doing here with my ultramarine blue, my primary yellow, and a hint of red. Uh, in this case, I may have used pyro red in this mixture. And then just adjusting it with, with the primaries. The one thing about a limited palette is that uh, it's pretty simple to figure out which color am I going to use because there's only one. One yellow, one red, one blue, so... Like I said, I'm not using a lot of the uh, secondary red that I put on the palette today. And the phalo I left untouched. But still, I think that this painting has enough color. And you will be surprised at how much color you can get and uh, the effect of color harmony when you go to a limited palette. And that way, too, if you do expand after, after a while from the primary uh, palette, you'll at least know why you're doing so. You'll begin to discover, okay, I can't quite reach uh, a certain color with, with what I've got on the palette. And so maybe I'm going to add um, a dioxazine purple, or I might use a, a cad orange and add that to my palette. Or maybe I go with a split primary palette where I've got two yellows, one cool, one warm, uh, same way with red and blue and then titanium white. Uh, that's another popular way to think about color. All right, so now you see that I have mixed up some darker greens, and I am just picking some spots where in the photo I see are darker than others, and I'm adding this, this darker green, which I can make the mixture of green darker by adding a little less yellow a little bit more blue, and a little bit of red. And of course, uh, down towards the roots is usually where you see some of the, the shadows, and, and up towards the, the top of the foliage usually is a little bit lighter. Give a couple of little corners of my brush to, to indicate some some places where that uh, vegetation may be kind of poking up into the, the landscape of the field. And notice that I put those little dots basically around the center of the focal point to draw your attention a little bit towards that tree. And then um, even though the tree is the focal point, 
I don't want you just to go to the tree and then, okay, what do we do now? Just hang around this tree? Uh, you notice that I've got an opening in the secondary uh, tree line that sits back further in the distance. And my hope is that the viewer's eye enters the picture towards that tree and then wanders back there and then up to the clouds and then kind of in a big circle from the tree to that space that we see between the, the, tr the distant trees into the clouds and then back around, uh, making basically a, a large circle and staying in the painting. Now here, I'm going to focus on the green that I want on the tree. So that dark kind of purple that served as the shadow color is now going to be covered up primarily by this green that I'm making. And so in order to make the color stick without making a mess, this is going to be a thicker pool of color. And, and you kind of see me doing that. And then I'm also adding some of that quick dry medium to, to allow me to, to once again also stay on the top of that initial lay-in color. And so here I'm looking for places where I see light hitting that tree. Now it may be a little hard for you to see this on the video because the tonal value is very close to the purple, which is what I wanted. So the hue though is changing from purple to green. And I'm laying in this thick, notice that I'm just a couple of strokes and then I'm putting it into the paint again. A couple more strokes, putting it into the paint. Now these are not my absolute lightest highlights. I'm gonna come back into the tree after I get this, this particular darker green on there, I still want some of the purple to show through, especially underneath the tree where we have the, the shadows. And I think you can see it here now that it doesn't look like a purple blob anymore. And uh, here in just a moment, you should be able to see that I'm gonna make a, just a slight Variation in that green by adding some more of the yellow primary. There we go. There's the yellow primary into that mixture. I'm lightening it up. I'm changing the tonal value. I still hope that when you squint that you're not going to see much of a difference between this color and the darker color on the tree. And, but uh, when you open your eyes fully, you can see the subtle shift in colors where the light is hitting that tree and here we got to be very confident we don't uh we don't want to give the impression that we don't that that we don't know where we're, we're going with this you'll notice that i pretty much make one stroke and then go to the palette pick up more of the paint and put in another stroke And I'm just kind of looking at where I see some of the variations of the, of the color. Just laying in that paint and then I leave it alone. Now right now you might be saying, well that, that tree looks a little bit blocky rather than realistic. Well, I'm gonna show you a technique that is really easy to use to to take care of that so hopefully here you see that i've still left some of the darker tones even as i as i put some of these highlights on of course one of the dangers in painting is that sometimes we can get a little too carried away with the highlights and then we got to go back in and re-establish the darks if that happens but uh, here I'm, I'm pretty pleased with what I see. I think you can tell that this tree is sitting in front of the uh, back, back line of trees. And then the foreground of the trees obviously has, has a little bit more brighter, vibrant colors, but I don't think it's enough to distract you 
And here I'm seeing a, a kind of a, a greenish grass coming through uh, the field that's closest to us. And so I'm doing that with these strokes. I'm, I'm trying to gently put this in as if the sun is illuminating a little bit. And that there's still some, some of that, uh, that brown ground kind of showing through there. But, but there's also a little bit of this lighter green I think that kind of breaks up the field colors a little bit more, so I think it's necessary. I don't want it to be a to look like a line, and so you saw how I, I kind of pushed and pulled the color around there, especially on the edges. So I liked how that turned out. I'm cleaning my brush off again. I, I, I put my brush cleaner on a desk that's next to my easel, and so every once in a while you see me totally cover up the painting, and you might be wondering what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. I've, I'm cleaning the brush off. There you see me using the paper towel to, to take some of that water and, and uh, paint off of my brush. Now, one thing I will say is that with the water mixable oils, don't leave your brushes with a lot of that oil in them because of the nature of this oil it's i think it acts more like acrylic paint when you leave paint in your brushes now that that could be something you want to look into especially if you're used to painting kind of um ugly with with oil brushes is that uh, sometimes you can get away with keeping um some of your oils in the brushes and this is not the kind of oil you want to use if, if you leave a lot of your oil just in the brushes. You really need to clean them after each session that you painted uh, thoroughly with the water, which is fine. You may also want to use a little bit of soap from time to time uh, to get that out. You may want to lay your brushes down too, so that way you don't have some of that um, oil uh, going down into the ferro of your brush and becoming stiff and ruining it. Okay, here, to make some variety in that ground plane and to indicate some of uh, the sun affecting and uh, hitting that ground, I just mixed up a, a, a mixture of basically titanium white, a little bit of the primary yellow, and a couple of the other colors that were already on the palette to, to take that color down just a notch. And then you see how I kind of put that right next to the shadow and so that makes the shadow of that tree more intense and it also gives us some variety in that ground plane so it's not just one big massive color then i see some of these spots you know kind of like a field uh that's been uh, recently mowed you will you will get these lines that kind of show up and so i was seeing a couple of lines in that photo and using this the same color uh, to distinguish that and also to pull your to pull your eye back to that empty space and then also i wanted to um, highlight some of the those back trees and push them back a little bit and so i used the same color uh, kind of as a border up there so uh, as as things regress they become a little lighter and so uh, put that strip underneath that and I think that works. And then I want to make sure that it's not just a line, that there's some other places in the field where, where you see a little bit more of the sun on it. And so uh, that's what I've done there. Uh, when you saw the camera move, I went back to, uh, to check out the painting and, and view it from a distance. And uh, I think I really like this. Now, now that you're coming in from the left of my painting around that tree, and it's almost as if there's a triangle there at the base of the tree pointing you to that space between the distant trees so that your your eye is moving in a, a circular pattern in the middle of the painting, hopefully, and holding your attention uh, to check out a few things. And, of course, you'll notice there's, there's really nothing in the way of uh, details here. 
it's just a matter of putting a few essential strokes, uh, some of the, the blocks of color, if you will, and that's about it. Now here, it seemed to me that that grass that I'd put in just, uh, it looked a little bit too artificial. And so now I'm putting in that lighter yellow color that I had mixed around the tree. And I'm now uh, putting those around places in that uh, foreground uh, with that little bit of a path that uh, separated that, that greenish grass that I, the path that I saw. And so I think there's, there's quite a bit of variety in this simple little painting. And in just a minute, you'll see me get the rubber tip eraser out. And I'm going to sign the painting on the right side. Oh, here. Here's the technique I was going to show you. So the tree looked a little boxy. So I'm taking a paper towel. And around the edge, around each of these edges of the tree... All I'm doing is, is just lightly touching the green and, and notice what that does. It's, it's now not so boxy. There's a, it, it's actually leaving the impression that there's some of these leaves that are, that are being blown that aren't as uh, sharp a focus around the outside of the tree. And of course you just go outside and observe and, and, Usually the, the darker masses of color are much more obvious in the center of the tree than outside it. I didn't put any uh, sky holes in today. Uh, just worked the edges a little bit. Felt that the tree was a little bit too far away for you to necessarily see a lot of um, sky holes. And actually the photo reference that I have doesn't show any sky holes at all in this tree. So it's a very thick tree, so I left it that way. Here, I'm also noticing that, uh, there we go, to soften out uh, that color around the tree. And no notice how, how the relationship of those two colors helps the eye to see the difference. And, and notice how the, the shadow then under the tree is more intense because there's a lighter value color next to it. And uh, one of the ways that you learn that is, is simply by practice. All right, so now I'm going to sign my, my name. I like to, to cut right into the paint with that rubber uh, tool. And you need to do that soon after you've painted so uh, that the paint hasn't dry. Uh, if, once the paint dries, it's kind of difficult to do that. Um, that happened to me one time. But at any rate, thank you so much for watching this short uh, video of this uh, painting. If you like the content, please be sure to subscribe and give me a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments to make, by all means, you can drop those in below. I always respond uh, to your comments, uh, usually within 24 hours. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, there should be a suggestion of another video that you may want to watch following this one. So thanks again. And I'll see you in the next video.